What up YouTube, it's Luca, back with another video, and this is a big video you're watching today, because I decided to make this video to voice my thoughts on the newest ARK DLC, Genesis Part 2. As most of you might know, this is most likely the last ARK DLC that will be focused on the main story, so there were certainly some major expectations from the fanbase for this DLC. With this review, I hope to explain to you from my point of view what aspects of this DLC I enjoyed and what aspects I think could be improved upon. I've been playing this game on PlayStation for almost four and a half years now, since just before the Ferrazinosaurus, Trudon, Squid, Pego and Jellyfish were added, and as someone who has often been frustrated with wildcard releases for this game, I have certain things to say about this final paid DLC. So let's dive in. Let's focus on the general experience first. You jump in, what's the first thing you see and do, and is what you see and do enjoyable or not so much? The early game of Genesis Part 2 is definitely the most different from any other map in ARK. You immediately start off with a fully fledged cutscene that leads you into the map and re-establishes Rockwell as the main villain, which is something that I liked. You already possess a tech suit that basically does all the early game resource harvesting for you, allowing you to progress at a breakneck pace if you so desire. It was very clear to me that this was all intentionally done to give players the sense that this really is the end game of ARK. Overall, the tone was set really well for these first few hours, even though it mostly wore off for me as I slid back into the general ARK gameplay loop. The supply drops actually give quality loot, and overall, this DLC really seems to urge the player to go big and go all out with whatever they want to do. It's clear that Wildcard had a lot of ambition going into this DLC, which is something they're known for. However, over the last few years, it's become increasingly clear that Wildcard's ambition is sometimes too big for their own good, and Gen 2 unfortunately isn't an exception. The biggest complaint I've always had about the arc maps isn't about game progression or balancing, after all, I don't play online, it's that the technical performance just underperforms. Many people already brought this up in relation to Genesis Part 1, and it feels to me like it comes to a head in this DLC. The technical performance of this DLC can best be summarized by this picture. Random crashes run rampant in this DLC and it really undermines the whole experience. It gives you the feeling of needing to walk on eggshells to properly enjoy the game, because it sometimes feels like everything can trigger a crash. Uh, traveling too fast, turning too suddenly, entering and exiting missions, logging out of the map, even just opening my inventory. There was even one time where unpausing the game was too much for it to handle. A lot of people share this frustration, as these crashes can wipe out hours of progress. I really don't want to make it seem like I'm beating a dead horse, but I learned the hard way that if your game crashes while doing or exiting a mission, your entire player inventory will be deleted. So I recommend to anyone to put most of your inventory inside a creature that you take with you to the mission platform, unless of course that creature falls through the ground and dies. Yes, that did happen to me. Again, I don't want to dwell on this for too long, as most ARC players can probably relate to what I'm saying, but do realize that this greatly impacted my assessment of this DLC. I'll summarize it by saying that the random crashes force you to play way too careful for fear of losing progress, which has a severe negative impact on the overall experience. There's also the issue of the loading zones. If you didn't know, 
At certain points when you are about to enter a new biome, you get these hiccups where the game has to load that biome in first. Personally, I don't mind these too much. As a long time player, I'm already used to them because of the artifact caves on the older maps. But I do admit that having them at such important routes in the overworld does sort of hold momentum. So overall, while the tone is great and the progression system is certainly unique, the technical performance of this DLC is the worst of all maps in my experience. Crashes happen all the time, there are loading zones at inconvenient places, and some areas take way too long to properly load in. All these aspects make the gameplay and general experience of Genesis Part 2 way worse than you would think coming from a grand conclusive chapter. Moving away from Genesis Part 2 on a technical level, let's instead examine it on a bit more of a visual level. This is where I have a lot more good things to say about this DLC. The visuals of this game are very good looking, and this especially holds true when it comes to this DLC. It's clear that a lot of effort went into designing this map visually, as well as the new creatures, who I will be individually discussing later. The Eden biome is probably where most players have started off. I actually like the Eden biome the least of all the biomes on this map. I just don't feel like there's much to set it apart from other free DLC maps. To me, it really embodies the phrase a giant world with nothing to do with it. This, it just seems like another generic uninspired arc biome. That's not to say that the entire map lacks in identity though. The in-between space ridge is in my opinion a beautiful use of the outer space environment, which makes this biome my favorite in all of Gen 2. Rockwell's Garden, the counterpart to the Eden biome, also isn't as interesting when it comes to terrain, but unlike Eden, it makes up for that because it's really drenched in its own identity. Playing on Rockwell's Garden is unlike anything else you've ever experienced in Ark, which is the key to making it a memorable biome memorable biome with a lot of identity, creating a unique experience. However, there is one more biome left. Inside Rockwell's garden are two access ways, leading to Rockwell's innards, the final biome of Genesis Part 2. Visually, this biome looks disgusting, and I don't mean that as an insult. However, this is where I have to be a nerd again and talk about gameplay because discussing Rockwell's innards on a visual and gameplay level is like night and day. I feel like this biome perfectly embodies how I think of this DLC. It is simultaneously the most, yeah, the most impressive environment and one of the most frustrating things in this DLC. Visually, it looks amazing, but gameplay-wise, it's a chore. And not because it's actually a chore to come collect mutagen every 10 hours or so, but because there are so many technical problems that you have to be wary to avoid. The new summoner may just be my, mo my new most hated creature, as it causes severe frame drops when aggroed, and can summon our creatures to pull you off your mount towards an almost instant death. On top of that, they summon a shield around them, and float quite a distance above the ground, so I still don't really know how to effectively combat them, causing more and more of them to spawn and pile up in certain areas, resulting in more gameplay struggles. There's also the Rockwell tentacles, which can fire a ball of goo to ground you, leaving you at the mercy of all the scary creatures below. A lot of players probably hate these things. I personally think they are fine for keeping players on their toes while inside Rockwell's innards, although the severe frame drops and lag definitely make them harder than intended to deal with. Don't think, however, that this one biome is enough to ruin the whole map. This map is definitely the most unique in Ark, which is mostly for the better. Speaking about chores, I wanted to add a quick se section about how I feel about the missions in this map. For those unaware, whereas in Genesis Part 1 you would find different missions in every single part of the world, in Genesis Part 2 there are several platforms scattered throughout the world that give you access to every mission, with every mission taking place in its own specially designed area 
unlike in Genesis Part 1, where all the missions, almost all the missions, took place in the overworld. I honestly don't know which approach I like the best. While it is convenient to have all missions accessible in one place, there's also less incentive to explore the map for missions. Having the missions cordoned off into their own area allows for more creativity, but then you run into the problems I mentioned earlier concerning more crashes and loss of player inventory. Therefore, I can't pick a better system. On top of the missions themselves, I think the quality has definitely improved from Gen 1. The Star Dolphin mission is the only mission I really don't like, but that's just because I don't know the controls. Also, it's very easy to go out of bounds. The canoe missions are pretty fun, but get boring after two attempts. The infiltration style missions are very well thought out, if not almost impossible for a single player. The other race missions are solid as well, and all unique. The mission I enjoy the most is the gauntlet, where you travel through all the arcs. It's basically just a running gun, and that's the type of gameplay that a lot of people can easily enjoy. The addition of temporary passive effects rewarded for completing missions is a clever way to incentivize replaying the missions, which was needed since the loot they give isn't that good anymore, outside of some of the alpha missions. So the missions definitely lean more towards the positive side in terms of my experience with Genesis Part 2. So I wanted to take a shorter part of the episode to quickly discuss the story of Ark Genesis Part 2. Seeing as this is the conclusive chapter to the whole lore, there are obviously going to be way more story beats than there were, than there were earlier, where the lore was at some points treated, treated more loosely. So if it wasn't obvious from the start, major spoilers are ahead. Starting right after the major cliffhanger that was the ending of Genesis Part 1, we find ourselves on the colony ship, taken over by Rockwell and slowly submitting to his influence. Our main goal throughout the DLC is to interact and hack into the very subsystems of the ship and fight or race our way through the missions in order to free these subsystems from Rockwell's control and thus weaken him to the point that a physical altercation is possible. Once we have completed every mission on a given difficulty, we will then be able to fight Rockwell on that difficulty. Initiating the boss fight from the boss terminal, located within Rockwell's innards, just below his heart, we are then taken into the final mission. After a final attempt from Rockwell to talk us out of it, that failed miserably, because everyone involved knows he won't be merciful, we finally take on Rockwell himself in his final form and his nearly infinite amount of heads. The structure of this boss fight is similar to Gen 1's final boss, in the sense that there are multiple side objectives you need to complete in order to expose the main body. First, you need to find and terminate a certain amount of super tentacles, after which you use a super-powered exomech to demolish one of Rockwell's exposed nodes, which... Wait, I'm not, I'm not the only one who thinks that's basically a warper from Subnautica, right? Anyway, Take the four exposed nodes out and Rockwell finally takes us on himself, at which point it becomes a fairly standard arc boss battle, just hit it hard until it dies. I found this boss battle to be quite entertaining, although I have heard that on other platforms it's quite laggy. I also found some of the banter during the fight to be irritating, not from Rockwell's side, but I didn't really like HLNA talking back so much. At a certain point I just got fed up with it. Anyway, after bringing Rockwell to his knees, not literally, we are forced to leave HLNA behind as she ensures that Rockwell is destroyed together with the corrupted colony ship, leaving us with the only remainder from the of the ship, the Eden biome, and a quest to build a new world from the ground up, also Vin Diesel. Overall, the storytelling of these final moments genuinely spoke to me, not just because I spent more time on this game than several doctors would recommend, but I like that every single character gets their story concluded in a satisfying way. Rockwell's last bit of humanity shining through in his final moments. It's so bright! Helena! 
HLNA discovering her place in the world. In our time together, I got to become something new. Someone new. Not Helena. HLNA. And the survivors alone to build a new world, which is basically where the survivors already were at the end of Extinction, but let's not talk about it. But overall, I think the story of Genesis Part 2 definitely is worthy of a conclusive chapter. Aside from the new focus on story, Genesis Part 2 also doesn't sell itself short as a DLC by adding a variety of new items and creatures exclusive to this map. Let's go over the creatures first, as I have more, more to say about them than the items. The first new creature many players will likely encounter is the Maywing, a hybrid of a platypus and a sugar glider. This creature is native to the Eden biome. They are meant to be a relatively early game team, as they do not have much torpor and thus can be knocked unconscious quite easily. On top of that, they are omnivores and thus can be fed with a large amount of food items, taming quickly even with regular berries. However, actually knocking the Maywing unconscious can pose quite a challenge. Upon being startled, the Maywing will quickly jump up and start gliding away from danger at high speeds. The easiest way to prevent this is by either trapping them with the new net projectile or pulling them close by consuming a rare flower. As for my overall opinion on the Maywing, I think it's perhaps the most well-balanced creature in this DLC. Whereas other creatures are over or underpowered, the Maywing I feel is right at home in its current state. It's got a lot of unique abilities benefiting the early and mid-game player, such as its ability to feed baby dinos reduce the weight of certain resources, and of course its excellent mobility. The Maywing is really suited for utility, as opposed to combat, which is why I feel like it gets left behind in the endgame. However, I find the Maywing to be one of the best early and mid-game creatures, and a very balanced creature in its current state. Another new creature players will find wandering around the Eden biome is the looming figure of the Strider. These gigantic robotic workhorses are difficult to fight due to their large health pool and possess a unique taming method not shared by any other creature. Taming a Strider requires two conditions to be met. The first is the number of missions the player has completed. Taming a Strider requires the player to have completed a certain amount of missions. The more missions completed, the higher level wild Striders can be tamed at. Striders also require a certain amount of the new Muta gel to initiate the taming process. As stated before, the taming process for Strider is really unique. Players are required to hack into the Strider, timing the alignment of codes to advance the taming meter. Striders also come equipped with several headgear and body wigs, with every Strider coming equipped with one of four possible head wigs and four possible body wigs, all serving a completely different purpose. This, this, in my opinion, keeps every encounter with a Strider feeling fresh and makes them to be a diverse creature, capable of almost anything. It's very easy to tame a Strider early on, even though it's meant to be an endgame creature, because low levels don't require many completed missions, and still come with a large amount of health and weight. A Strider equipped with the Excavation Head Rig and Resource Attractor Rig is one of the best resource harvesters in the game in my experience. The head excavation rig pulls in all resources in front of you, while the body resource attractor rig reduces the weight of all those resources by 65%, allowing you to harvest a huge amount of raw materials before being full up. I have not yet examined the strider offensively, as I want to tame a high level to use offensively, but overall the strider is an amazingly diverse creature, perhaps even too good but a welcome addition to the game regardless. Leaving the Eden biome behind, the in-between space bridge houses two new creatures, the Astrodelphis and the Void Worm. I'll cover the Astrodelphis first since it's more common in this biome. This creature, literally named Space Dolphin, can be seen in small or large groups throughout all of the space biome. 
Taming one requires the player to repeatedly pet it and feed it increasing numbers of elements. The setup for the Astro Delphys is also quite unique. Similar to the Tropio Natus, the setup for the Astro Delphys has an exhaust, allowing it to speed up rapidly in mid-air. The Astro Delphys setup uses element as fuel, in contrast, in contrast to the Tropio Natus setup using gasoline. Just like the Tropio Natus, players can store grenades inside the Astro Delphys' inventory to fire a powerful blast from the saddle at their targets. Finally, the saddle can also use that aforementioned element to fire short lasers. This creature is very cool design-wise, it's very cute, but mechanically, I find them and their saddles a bit difficult to control. They have also been hit with several nerfs. Their food also seems to deplete very fast compared to other creatures, especially just after taming. Therefore, I've kept my Astrodelphus mostly tucked away in a cryopod. Their assortment of weaponry def definitely makes them a threat in terms of power, but the rapid food consumption makes them a somewhat demanding thing. I think this does a good job at balancing its power, and combined with the recent nerfs, make the Astrodelphus a strong but not overwhelming creature in my opinion. The other creature that I mentioned lives, lives in space by him is the Void Worm. This is basically a tech wyvern, matching the proportions and attack patterns of its organic counterpart. The name tech wyvern is also used to address the void worm in its ID. The, the, in the wild, these creatures are a fearsome foe. They aggro from very far and will continuously fire their breath attack at the player. A wide raging shockwave, dismounting and stunning the player if hit by it. On top of that, they possess a natural damage reduction, meaning the best way to combat them is using creatures capable of inflicting a bleed. To tame this flying menace, players must first bring it down to lower health, at which point most Void Worm will attempt to flee. Then, similar to taming an Equus, players must mount the wild creature and feed it the new item Mutagen when the creature barrel rolls while holding on for dear life. In single player at least, I find the Void Worm to be a bit underwhelming because their breath attack does very little damage to wild creatures. However, I can't deny that being able to stun and dismount opposing players will make this creature highly valuable in a PvP environment. So overall, the Void Worm is a cool but underwhelming creature, at least from the perspective of a single player player. Moving on, we have finally entered the Rockwell side of the map. I've already complained enough about the summoners, and since you can't tame them, at least not legally, I don't have much more to say about them. I also don't have much to say about the little macro fake swarms other than they're annoying. Which brings us to the final new creature to discuss, the shadow main, or lionfish as that's what it's called in the files. Before I go into detail about this creature's abilities and taming method, I have to first address the somewhat dubious state the shadow main is in right now. As of right now, Many people believe that the Shadow Main will be nerfed heavily very soon, but the Astro Delphys was seemingly prioritized in terms of balancing, as the Shadow Main has remained almost completely untouchable since the release of Genesis Part 2. Right now, we don't have official word from Wildcard that a nerf is coming, but many people believe it will happen sooner or later. So what makes the Shadow Mains so worthy of a nerf, according to the community? First, let's discuss how to tame them. The Shadow Main is tamed passively, just like other creatures that require passive things, like for example a Bloodstalker. Taming these creatures is similar, not only because their taming food is unique, but also because both taming processes absolutely suck. To start, you need to fill, feed filled baskets to a Shadow Main in order to tame them, preferably those filled with bigger fish to tame faster and with higher effectiveness. These are already a strenuous task together, given this DLC's propensity for crashing randomly, but even after gathering all the fish, the worst has yet to come. Shadow mains can only be fed while sleeping, meaning you can only tame them during the day, as they won't fall asleep at night. After feeding, the shadow main will get up and wander around briefly while invisible. This forces you to retreat to avoid being aggroed on and losing the taming progress. It's also best not to let it aggro on other creatures that might mess up the taming process too, 
which makes this creature somewhat RNG dependent, with the pathfinding of both the Shadow Mane and other wild creatures. In short, taming these things is brutal. My first attempt at taming one went horrible. It was only when the taming bar randomly reset to 0%, with the Shadow Mane literally aggroed on nothing after 5 hours of attempts, that I realized I should probably just give up for the day and go outside. After a week or two, I attempted it again with an effective trap I found on YouTube. I'll link that video in the description. Disclaimer, it does only work on single player from what I've heard. Anyway, using that trap I did manage to finally tame a level 145 male and female. Now I haven't used them too much since I'm mostly breeding them in order to attempt the snow cave with a pack of shadow mains. But the shadow main has access to a wide range of abilities that differ between males and females. Both can leap far distances, stun every enemy in a close range, have access to the aforementioned invisibility and can, by attacking repeatedly, charge up a bar that unleashes a devastating blow when failed and activated. If this attack kills a creature, it instantly refreshes, allowing it to be spammed when fighting groups of weaker enemies. The males also have access to a courage warlike buff when in the presence of females. Similar to Spinos, Shadow Mains also get a hydration buff when entering a body of water. As you can imagine, all these abilities in tandem, especially the courageous war, combined with the hydration buff and the charge blow, and maybe a few melee mutations on top of an imprint boost, yield a ridiculously high damage output, which is the main reason many people think they will be nerfed heavily. Personally, I think the Shadow Mains are indeed too strong, but I don't think they need to be nerfed that much. If I were to nerf the Shadow Mane, I would probably remove the refresh on the killing blow if it kills a creature, and maybe just remove the hydration buff to lessen their overall damage output. But in my opinion, the Shadow Mains are definitely slightly overpowered, but given the immense difficult immensely difficult taming process, I don't think they should be nerfed all that much. So that was all the new creatures, but Genesis Part 2 also adds new weapons and items. I have much less to say about these, so I'll just quickly steam through them. I have literally never used a canoe in the overworld, so I guess I don't really have much to say about it. It just seems like a smaller and more maneuverable raft. The loadout mannequin is a cool idea, although a bit large. I just haven't used it that much, but for PvP this is probably big. I'm probably never going to use the pitch charge. The net projectile is one of the most overpowered things to ever happen to this game. You could literally trap almost everything in the game. I'm fairly certain it's called a nerf though, but it's still pretty good. The ammo box is good for PvP I guess. I've only used the tech canteen for a couple of days, but I already don't understand how I've ever lived without it. The minigun is fairly cool, though I'm still doubting whether it's really worth so much ammo. I haven't leveled an up, up enough to use a tech pistol legit yet, but this thing is being talked about like it's the most broken thing on the planet. Back when I was still able to use the tech bow, I quickly discovered that this was my new favorite weapon. It's so fun to use and basically allows you to carry a damage bow and a tranking bow in one. It's also pretty good in terms of tranking and damaging, and it's also relatively cheap to use if you don't frequently use the exploding shots. The egg incubator is the best thing they ever added in any DLC, hands down. I will die on this hill. The tech hover sail is pretty stylish, but I don't really see myself picking it over capable teams. The tech crop plot and R seeds by extension are a good way to quickly get prime meat and fish meat, though it's probably not really worth it for normal meat and fish meat. The concept of tech surveillance sounds really cool, though I'll probably never use it on single player. I can't really give an opinion on the ExoMag since I haven't used it yet and can't unlock it yet. To me, it just seems like a worse mag, but do take that with a grain of salt. And finally, the new Mutagel and Mutagen. Uh, for the Mutagel, I mean, I guess I don't really have much to say about it, since it's mainly just 
used to craft the mutagen, but the mutagen itself is actually pretty interesting. What it does is when fed to non-bred creatures, it raises their base stats by about 5 level points. So basically their base stats get amped up a little bit. This is going to be very handy when breeding for bosses and stuff like that. So I feel, feel like this is definitely a good, uh, a good addition. So, that just about covers everything in this DLC. Some things more extensively than others. I could have gone more into detail about many things, but this script is already 7.5 pages long, so I didn't really want to drag on with minute details. To summarize, this DLC is the definition of a double-edged sword. On the terms of design, be it visually or auditory too, there's much to praise in this DLC. Everything in Genesis Part 2 feels creative without abstaining from what everyone knows and expects from Ark. The sandbox survival setting is maintained while adding new elements to keep players interested, and when the survival aspect does get overshadowed by story beats, the story is presented in a direct and engaging way. It really shows that Wildcard has become experienced with handling the survival experience and also creating an engaging narrative alongside it. But on the other side of the spectrum, the technical aspect of this game is honestly in shambles. This is especially frustrating when realizing the importance of a good technical performance and how much it would improve the DLC if the situation bettered. I could praise the visual design, auditory design and story beats almost indefinitely, but what's the point if the game itself can't even keep up with what you've created? When you get frustrated trying to play the game, and are unable to see the pretty visuals through the crashes anymore, when you don't feel like you're getting an authentic experience. I don't like putting number scores on ARC maps just after release, because there's so much room for the devs to make changes in the week after release, like they have already done with this map. Everything could very well change, and if certain things do change, my opinion might very well change too. But I feel like it's important to provide you with my opinion on everything altogether, as I've expressed both highly positive and negative opinions on different individual aspects in this video. So, considering everything I've talked about in this video, the terrible technical performance, the great design, the engaging story beats and the hit or miss nature of the creatures and items, I feel like I can't give Ark Genesis Part 2 anything higher than a 6 or a 7.5 out of 10. It's great conceptually, but, in te but technically it sucks, and the technical side is a big deal. I don't feel like I need to justify my score anymore. I've brought my opinions on everything forward plenty of times, and I'm sure many of you pi might pull completely different conclusions based on what I said. If you feel like it, comment your own thoughts down below, and I might discuss it with you. Before I properly end the video, I want to have a chat with Wildcard. I know they'll, prob they'll probably never watch this video directly, but I still want to get my point across. First of all, please don't mess up Lost Island, because this map looks like everything I personally want out of your game. Secondly, just take your time. It always seems like you're looking too far ahead. We've just had Genesis Part 2 released, now you're teasing Lost Island, and there are rumors going around that there will be another map released after, on top of Arc 2 now properly announced and set up through Genesis Part 2. I can't help but feel like Genesis Part 2 is going to get left behind after a couple more weeks, which is not good because Gen 2 needs more than a couple weeks of work to get into form. It frustrates me that you created a DLC that I could have given an 8 or even 9 out of 10, but is now stuck with a 6.5 because it's so annoying to actually play on. I don't want to command you, which is never going to happen anyway, but I would just like you to listen to what is wrong with the older DLCs without them being left in the dust. All I ask of you is to just take your time. Thank you for watching everyone. This was my first time doing like an actual structured review, so I'm left to wonder if I got my point across. It also took a long time to edit, with me being of course a more mobile focused creator. 
Regardless, I'm gonna go now. If you're new, check out some of my other videos on ARC or something else. I hope you to see you all in a good mood in the next video and goodbye.